This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, this is the second lecture on Chapter 9 of the paper, F5 Lecture Notes, Short-Term Decision Making. And if you remember in the previous lecture, I said there were three uh, different techniques, topics we were going to go through. And so the last one we looked at uh, shutdown decisions. This one, in fact the most important of the three from the point of view of the exam, is relevant costing. And although as always I'll explain it by using the example, uh, just let me give you a very brief introduction to it. Suppose your company currently makes desks. We make thousands and thousands of desks. That's our, our, our work. And with being through already how you might go about getting the cost per unit and then deciding on a selling price. But we're quite happily producing uh, desks. But suppose somebody comes along and says, could we, as a special one-off job, make them 200 tables? We're quite capable of making tables, you know, they're very similar to desks. But this isn't going to be a new long-term product for us, like desks are. It's just a one-off job. Can you make me 200 desks? How much will you charge? Well, surely, because it's just a one-off job, the approach we're going to take is say, OK, if we do make these desks, what extra costs will be involved? Um, perhaps we've already got space in the factory, so we won't need any more space. There'll be no more rent or anything. Uh, we'll obviously need some wood, so that'll cost money, and so on. And if I worked out oh, the extra costs we'd have come to a total of 10,000, then all right, I'll quote to the guy who wants these uh, tables, I'll quote as high a figure as I can, you know, I'll say it will charge 20,000, but there's likely to need, need some negotiating, he'll offer less, and so on. But if I know to do it is going to cost me an extra 10,000, I know that whatever, however much we negotiate, I'm going to have to charge more than 10,000 if it's going to be worthwhile. So that may seem a simple idea, and it is, the idea is very simple. But that's what we're going to do, as you'll see, when it's a one-off special contract, which is always where this is relevant, we're going to work out what extra costs will our business have if we do the work. So look at example two. Um, have a very quick look at the question with me and then we'll get on with it. The managing director of Parcel Limited, a small business, is considering undertaking a one-off contract and has asked her inexperienced accountant to advise on what costs are likely to be incurred so she can price at a profit. And this inexperienced accountant has come up with this schedule, her uh, wages 28,500, supervisor like that, and so on, and come up with a total cost of 98,300. And there are lots of notes there which shortly we'll read, note one, note two, note three, uh, explaining what's exactly happening. Now, it's an inexperienced accountant, so the danger, of course, is they've not done it properly, because it's a one-off contract, we should be doing what I said a minute ago, what extra cost will there be if we do the work? And so we're going to have to check. And the question, if you look to the end of the question, which is on the next page, he says, adjust the schedule prepared by the accountant to a relevant cost basis incorporating appropriate opportunity costs. Now, I've yet to explain the word opportunity costs, and I will as we go through. But what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this schedule, direct wages first of all. And when we've read the relevant note, we'll decide what figure should be brought in. Maybe 28,500 is right, maybe it's wrong, you know, but we're going to make sure we get the right figure. So I'm going to redo the whole schedule, read the notes as we go along. So let's do wages. Note one. 
Direct wages comprise the wages of two employees, particularly skilled in the labour process for this job, who could be transferred from another department to undertake work on special order. So we, we've got these two men, they pay 28,500. And they would be moved from their existing work to this new job. Well, so far there's no extra cost. We pay, we're going to be paying them 28,500, whatever. If we don't do the job, they stay where they are and they pay 28,500. If they do do the new job, we move them and they still pay 28,500. So, so far, there's no extra cost involved at all. But let's carry on. They are fully occupied in their usual department and subcontracting staff would have to be brought in to undertake the work left behind. And subcontracting costs would be 32,000 for the period of the work. So what's gonna happen? We move these two men and we're paying them whatever. But, because we've moved them, we are going to have to spend 32,000 on subcontractors. And surely there is an extra cost. If we don't do the job, we wouldn't be paying that 32. If we do do the job, we would be. That is relevant. Except we're not quite there. Different subcontractors who are skilled in the special order techniques are available to work on the special order and their costs would amount to 31,300. So in fact, we'd have a choice. We either move the two men and pay 32,000 for people to do their work, or we leave the two men where they are and get these different subcontractors and have them do the new job, and that'll cost 31,300. Well, surely, if we don't do the new job, we'll choose whichever's the cheapest. And so, in fact, the best way of doing the new job, the cheapest way of doing it, will be to different subcontractors. And so, here's my schedule proper. The relevant cost is 31,300. And if this was the only cost involved, I'm quite happy to do this new job, provided I can charge more than the extra 31,300 that we're having to pay. Okay, so we've done the first one. And we're going to carry on with the others. Uh, but one thing about relevant costing is there's very little here you can actually learn. Every question's different. You can't just learn six different rules here. Um, the problem is understanding the logic. Once you've got the idea of it, what we're trying to do with the approach we're taking, then it's actually quite easy. The problem in the exam um, is the reading. You know, uh, um, just that one could uh, quite happily be a multiple choice question. And the problem is there's a lot to read there. You know, and it's so easy, especially when you're rushing, to misread and do silly things. But you couldn't learn, number one. I mean, number one might never appear again. Anyway, let's carry on. What about the second one? I picked the same order, obviously. Supervisor costs. Eleven five hundred. Let's read the note. A supervisor would have to work on the special order, and the cost of eleven five hundred, which is what the next minister accountant got, is comprised of eight thousand normal payments plus a three and a half thousand additional bonus for working on the special order. Normal payments refer to the fixed salary of the supervisor. So we've got a supervisor there who's paid a salary of 8,000. And surely, a bit like what we discussed in the previous one, they're going to be paid that salary of 8,000, whether they give them some extra work or whether they don't give them some extra work. They paid a fixed salary, they're not paid for how much work they're actually doing. 
So the 8,000 is going to have to be paid whatever happens and is therefore not relevant. But they are going to get an extra 3,500 for working on the special order. So doing the special order will involve us paying this bonus, this extra payment of 3,500, an extra cost. Oh, we're not quite there because we carry on reading. In addition, the supervisor would lose incentive payments in his normal work. So it appears that currently he's not just getting the 8,000 salary, but currently he's also getting another bonus, an incentive payment of 2,500. And if we do have the supervisor work on the special order, he'll lose that two and a half. We won't need to pay it. So although on the one hand we're paying him three and a half thousand new bonus, on the other hand we save what we're currently paying him. We save two and a half thousand. And so in fact the extra cost of doing this special order it's going to cost us an extra thousand. There is one more line. It is not anticipated that any replacement costs relating to the supervisors working other jobs would arise. So there's no other costs involved. It's not like the previous one where we were going to have to get in some other staff. So the overall effect on us, as far as the supervisor is concerned, is simply that we'll end up paying him a thousand more than we currently are. Good. What about the next one? Uh, what is the next one? Overheads. Again on the schedule, uh, there's a figure there of four thousand, but let's read the notes. General overheads comprise an apportionment of 3,000 plus an estimate of 1,000 incremental. Well, you should have seen both those words before, but what an apportionment is, it's a share of an existing cost. Uh, for instance, the factory as a whole, we may be paying rent of uh, 20,000 for the factory. And for profit purposes, we might share that, apportion it between different products. We decided, or this young experienced accountant, decided to give this special job a share of it of 3,000. But of course, I only want to know any extra costs or savings there'll be. And if I'm paying 20,000 a year rent, well, unless we tell it differently, presumably we'll still be paying 20,000 a year rent, whatever we do. Share it any way we like, but I'm, all, I'm only worried if we actually have to spend more. And just sharing doesn't mean you spend more. The 3,000 is not relevant. It does now say, though, plus an estimate of 1,000 incremental overheads. Incremental means extra. So if we specifically told there are extra overheads, there's an extra cost and it's relevant. But just sharing an existing total, no extra cost, not relevant. So this extra or incremental, that is relevant a thousand. Uh, so again, I, I, I appreciate it's taking me a while to say each of these, but arithmetically, so far, I think they've been pretty easy and pretty quick combination of either a lot to read and be careful or uh, this one I think was just more just terminology. Apportionment not relevant it's just a share. Incremental extra. Extra by definition is relevant. Uh, next one machine depreciation. Machine depreciation represents uh, the normal period cost based on the duration of the contract. Ugh. 
Now, although you wouldn't expect it to do depreciation, paper F5, you should all be aware from earlier exams what you mean by depreciation. Uh, and, you know, you have several ways you can calculate depreciation. But do we not normally work out the depreciation each year? It's a period cost. Well, fine. This machine depreciation is based on the, uh, the normal cost, based on the duration of the contract. But surely, unless we're having to buy a special machine, and he certainly doesn't say that, if we've already got this machine, then surely we'll be depreciating it, whether or not we do this work. There's no extra cost involved. We've already spent the money and bought the machine. That's only relevant if it meant buying a new machine. However, the second sentence, it's anticipated that 500 will be incurred in additional extra incremental maintenance costs. Extra cost is relevant. So depreciation itself is not relevant at all. But this extra maintenance, extra cost, how much was it? I've lost it. 500. Ah, what about number five? Machine overheads for running costs such as electricity are three dollars an hour. Now, of course, this is different because it's a variable cost, whereas fixed overheads in total stay fixed unless you're totally different. Variable overheads like electricity. I think it makes sense that if you work more hours you've got more cost. It's estimated that 6,000 hours will be needed for the special order. Fine. I'll read the rest in a minute. But if it's going to take uh, 6,000 hours, to do the special order, then the 6,000 extra $3 an hour having to be paid. And so, electricity what is it, 6,000 hours? $3 an hour, 18,000. Okay, so far so good. If you finish there, that would be the end of it. But what does it then say? The machine has 4,000 hours available capacity. So there's a moment, there's 4,000 hours when it's not doing any work and we're not paying any electricity, therefore, do an extra 4,000 hours, extra work, extra electricity. The other 2,000 hours, though, because we need 6,000 in total, will mean an existing job is taken off the machine, which loses contribution of $2 an hour. Now then, forgetting anything else, if we do do this special contract, we'll steal 2,000 hours from another job, That'll lose us $2 an hour, so we'll lose 4000 Well, I'm only going to do the uh, new job if it gives me more than 4000 And so this lost contribution This is something different from the others. All the others we've looked at so far were extra costs. Here we're not actually going to be spending anything, this extra contribution, this contribution, but we're losing the income that we're currently getting. And if I'm losing 2,000 hours at $2, if I'm losing 4,000, then surely, forgetting everything else, the new job's got to earn me at least 4,000 to be worth it. And so, the lost contribution, 2,000 hours at $2, is 
is 4,000. Effectively, it's a cost of doing the project, the, the, the contract. Again, the contract's got to give us at least 4,000 to make it worthwhile losing that. And there's another bit of terminology. We call this an opportunity cost. An opportunity cost um, refers to lost income. So this sort of question, you've either got direct costs where you're actually spending extra money, or you've got opportunity costs where you're not spending, but you're losing income that you would otherwise have earned. All right. Number six. Number six is a very important, a very common one. You know what it, we, I, I said earlier, every question's different. Uh, it's the thinking that matters and the reading. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but there's always likely to be um, at least one on materials, which is note six. Materials represent the purchase costs of some 7,500 kilos bought some time ago. So we need materials for this job, and you look at the schedule, there's 34,000 there, and that's how much we paid for 7,500 kilos some time ago. That's not relevant. We've more to read, obviously, but we paid um, that 34,000 some time ago. And whether we do the contract or we don't do the contract doesn't affect the fact we've paid it. Now, say we're not there yet, there's more to read. But, you know, do the contract, all right, we've, we've already spent 34,000. Don't do the contract, we've already spent 34,000. So, so far, there's no mention of us having to spend any more. Next one, the materials are no longer used and are unlikely to be wanted in the future except on the special order. And the complete inventory of materials, which there happen to be 10,000 kilos there, remember we only need 7,500, uh, but all the inventory or part of it could be sold for 420. Ah, before we read the next bit, why is that relevant? If we do the contract, we just take the material off the shelf, we don't have to spend any more, it's there. In that sense, it's free. But if we didn't do the contract, we would sell those 7,500 kilos for 420 a kilo, and we'd get some income. So we have another opportunity cost here. What is it, materials? We need 7,500 kilos per the question. Again, if we didn't do the contract, we'd sell it and earn $4.20. By doing the contract, sorry, I'm trying to find my calculator. Anyway. By doing the contract, uh, we're losing income that we could have received. And so again, it's an opportunity cost of doing the work. Seven and a half thousand at 420 is 31,500. Uh, better read that uh, last sentence though in note six. The replacement cost of the material used would be 33,375. Well, why on earth would I want to replace it? You know, buying new would be 33,375. If we didn't have any inventory, fine, I'd have to buy new and pay 33,375. But we're certainly not going to buy any new. We're just going to steal material that's already there. As a result, we'll lose the income we could have had. All right, over the page, nearly there. Because the business does not have adequate funds to finance the special order, a bank overdraft of 20,000 will be required for the project duration of three months and will be repaid at the end of the period. The overdraft rate is 18%, and I haven't written, but you would be told, 18% a year. 
Now, when this was asked, in the, I mean, this was actually an old exam question, a very old one. And when he was asked, a lot of people got very upset. Or perhaps they weren't upset, but they got it wrong. Because the fact it needs a, an overdraft of 20,000, they thought, oh, we're going to have to spend an extra 20. Let's stick that on our list as well. But it doesn't say we're having to spend an extra 20. It doesn't say, oh, we have to go out and buy a machine and spend 20,000. It's just that while we're doing this work, this work, because of doing the work, it means our bank balance goes negative for a period and then stops being negative. And so it's not costing us 20,000. We're not spending that 20,000 on any specific bit. We needed the overdraft to cover the cost of everything else we've listed. But the, the extra cost that will be involved is interest. You know, if we didn't do the job, we wouldn't have an overdraft, there wouldn't be interest payable. Do the job or overdraw? Well, there will be interest and extra cost. And of course, the expense accountant has left it off. We need to add it on. And what will the interest be? Uh, it's 18% on an overdraft of 20,000. But for how long? It says for the duration of three months. And so the interest that we'll have to pay is 900. I think with that, the managed to service specials such as this relevant costing should be used to incorporate opportunity costs. Which is appropriate to create a, a, a revised costing schedule. Well, there we are, we've got everything. And so let's now get the correct total cost, if you're patient with me, uh, 31,300, 1,000, 1,000, 500. So I hope I've done my additions right, I think I have, but 88,200, <coughs> excuse me. What's the relevance of it? Relevance rather than cost. It's the relevant cost of the job. Um, the relevance I said at the very beginning. Having done that, we will go out and quote a price to this customer, and obviously you like to quote as high a price as you think you'll pay. Maybe you'll quote 100,000. But if we start negotiating, uh, they want to pay less and so on. Well, we can afford to go as low as 88,200. Well, it has to be more than 88,200 uh, for it to be profitable. So as long as we can get more than that, then it is worth doing the work. So, you know, it's just you need to know that, surely, when you're negotiating. Otherwise, they say, well, I'll pay you 50, and the danger is you'll say, okay, we'll take 50. You know, <laughs> we needed to do that work. Uh, before I leave it, just one bit of terminology, or one more bit of terminology. If you look back to um, the materials note six, it said materials represent the purchase cost, so the 34,000 that's currently on the schedule represents the cost of um, 7,500 kilos bought some time ago. And I said that was not relevant <clears throat> because whether we do the contract or we don't, that money has already been spent. It's dead money. It's not relevant. And so that is called a sunk cost. A sunk cost is where we've already spent the money. And because we've already spent it, uh, whatever happens, it is not relevant. Now, the general energy matters because there can be, I mean, here, it didn't matter what we called it, it's just the fact that we didn't bring it in. 
Uh, but you can get questions where they ask you specifically, check you do understand what you mean by a sunk cost or an opportunity cost. Sunk cost, you already spent the money, not relevant. And I will add one more, which doesn't apply, I don't think, to this question. But if you ever see the word a committed cost, A committed cost is where you haven't yet paid the money, but you're going to have to pay it, whatever happens. So a committed cost is where you've not yet paid, but will have to pay whether or not we do the new work. So uh, I hope I'm making sense. <clears throat> you know, that material's one. We haven't, we've already spent the money. But if I told you, oh, we've already got that materials bought some time ago, uh, we haven't yet paid for them, but what happens? We're going to have to pay 34,000 uh, 34, for them. Well, because we're going to have to pay the money, whatever happens. We call it a committed cost. And again, it's not relevant. The two things that are relevant are incremental costs, any extra costs of doing the work, and opportunity costs, the income, the lost income that we would otherwise have received. All right, so that took me a while, but um, and we've one more technique to do, which I'll do in the next lecture. But of, uh, I've already said, I think, of the three techniques, shut down, relevant costing, and next time make a buy, by far the most important is relevant costing. You know, it really is a question of practice. Um, as always, there's a test when we come to the end of the chapter, that there's some questions there. But otherwise, it's your revision kit or exam kit, a way of practice, 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 and get used to the wordings uh, and the thinking. And obviously, use the Institute of Forum if you come to one which. You can't sort out why the answer is what it is.